it is uh, August 5th, and we are privileged to have James Frith of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Why don't you first uh, introduce uh, yourself, and a lot of people know Bloomberg and Bloomberg NEF, but it's always good to quickly summarize what you're doing kind of like in the EV space broadly and what you do specifically. Uh, so I'm James Frith. I head up the um, energy storage team at Bloomberg NEF. That team focuses on the technology side of the storage industry. Um, so a lot of our time is spent looking at lithium-ion batteries, but we also look at other storage technologies, whether that's flow batteries um, or uh, kind of emerging technologies for the stationary storage space like gravity storage. Today, today we're going to be speaking on lithium-ion batteries, talking about the technology trends um, that we see coming there, the impact on, on raw materials. More broadly, BNEF as a whole covers the energy transition. The teams that I work with look kind of quite specifically at the power sector and the transport sector. So we have everything from um, raw material supply and demand up with our metals and mining team down to electric vehicle forecasts um, and safety storage forecasts with our um, advanced transport team. It's a fast moving world. Uh, we uh, expect uh, some shakeouts and uh, some clear trends hopefully going to emerge in battery chemistries for electric vehicles. This year, we've seen um, in China a pivot away from mid-nickel to high-nickel um, cathode or LFP, so it's one way or the other. Um, I saw a very nice uh, slide in terms of your detailed um, breakdown of, of chemistries for, uh, I presume it was for passenger EVs. There's two things happening at the moment. We almost, in some respects, have more clarity on the kind of chemistries that we can expect, expect in the market going forward over the next kind of decade or so because we have automakers releasing their long-term roadmaps where they're actually kind of specifying chemistries these days. Um, but on the other hand, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, particularly in the next couple of years over um, which different vehicle segments are gonna sell the most and therefore, you know, are we gonna have more LFP in the market or more um, high nickel chemistries in the market? Um, if we, I guess, kind of take a step forward to 2030, 2035, I think one thing is clear. By that point, we have upfront price parity between all kind of passenger electric vehicle segments. It's slightly easier to kind of understand how the market will be split. And the way that we see it at Bloomberg NEF um, is that around a fifth of the market um, on a gigawatt hour basis will go to entry level chemistries, if we like. So LFP particularly, um, where low cost is the main driver. Then you have around a third of the market, which will be the kind of volume segment. Um, and this is where you need to get that balance between um, performance, so range specifically, charging rates as well, um, and cost. And really the, the leading chemistries that we see for that at the moment are manganese rich chemistries. And there's a variety out there that may come to fruition. Um, I think lithium nickel manganese oxide is probably one of the most well-known ones. It's a spinel material that has a high voltage plateau. Um, so hard to integrate at the moment because you need new um, electrolytes, but um, we expect that that could start entering the market in the next kind of four or five years or so. Um, but you can also have um, manganese rich varieties of uh, the common NMC. Um, so we think those type of manganese kind of heavy manganese dominant chemistries will occupy, as I say, around a third of the market in that volume segment. Um, and then the rest of the market will go to the high performance um, chemistries where really kind of range is the main driver and, and charging rates, et cetera. And for those, uh, for that segment, we expect that it's going to be um, high nickel that um, is at the forefront of the market. Uh, now, I just want to kind of clarify quickly here that uh, I'm talking on a um, on a kind of gigawatt hour basis, and the reason I mentioned that is because if you look at EV sales on a kind of vehicle sold basis um, in China in um, the first quarter of this year, um, around a third or a little over the market, a little more than the market, um, a third of vehicles sold used LFP, um, but not quite a third of the market used uh, on a gigawatt hour basis was LFP, and that's because the kind of highest selling EV was the Huangong Mini, which uses LFP, but it only has a 14 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, so although the kind of, you know, there's loads of these battery packs going onto the road, actually there's more vehicles with larger packs, kind of 50, 60, 70, or even 100 kilowatt hours 
out there that are using NMC. So on a gigawatt hour basis, although you may have more vehicles with NFP, the share doesn't necessarily um, end up being split like that. I think that's an important distinction that a lot of people overlook. And that is, and we agree, we say it's about the cells, not the sales. Um, that's our tagline. So uh, we're with you. And, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Wuling, the 13.8 kilowatt hours, the big battery pack, there's a nine one as well. So, um, and that, that brings us into, um, along those lines is if you look at uh, today's announcement from the Biden administration targeting 40 to 50% EV penetration in the US, those, you know, most of the vehicles have inordinately large battery packs. A lot of them, I mean, you could, you know, a lot of it's 100 or even higher. I mean, the Rivian, the base pack, I think, is 130 or 135, and the longer range is 180. So we really are talking, you know, bigger. So I guess um, it, with that announcement, it's going to be a tough target because I think. Um, as far as battery metals are concerned, 2025, it's kind of already baked in. I, I, I don't know, unless a project is already up to, regardless of whether it's lithium or nickel, unless it's already funded and planning, you know, construction, you, you're not going to add to the 2025 production numbers. So it's going to be tough. But 2030, I guess we have time. Would this announcement um, sort of reinforce or even skew your, your projections further, you know, with those sort of numbers? Going to the US, everything has to be bigger. And I think we're going to see that with battery packs. And these are going to be high performance packs using that kind of nickel based chemistry. Um, so that will kind of really skew it compared to those 13.8 or 9 kilowatt hour um, um, packs in China. As to the Biden announcement, that will skew it by 2030. In our long term electric vehicle outlook, about 25% um, of the US market, we expect to be EV. Um, so obviously, with the announcement from the um, Biden administration pushing it up to 50%, um, that's obviously going to have a large impact on both battery demand in the US and, as you say, kind of raw material demand. Uh, and while you say, uh, well, as you say, kind of 2025 is baked in, if projects aren't kind of, um, you know, moving along yet, it's, it's a bit too late, but we will start to see, I would expect, kind of an uptick in um, adoption starting from 2025 if you want to meet that 2030 target, because you can't just go from kind of, you know, 10% in 2029 suddenly to 50% in, um, in 2030. So there'll need to be some planning there. The, the thing that I would just caution at the moment, and, you know, hopefully this changes, but is that it is just a target. So until we see some legislation to back it up, um, I don't think we would uh, be any to kind of change our forecasts because we need to see the kind of um, action on the ground. From a consumer's perspective, it's hard to see why many people would be going out in 2030 and buying an EV, uh, sorry, an ICE anyway, just because the economics of EVs will be so favourable and performance will be so good. And that was about the, the point I was about to raise with you. So if everything is, is uh, from an economics and a total cost of ownership perspective superior, before then. And then, of course, the other thing as well is in countries where you have a hard cutoff in new ice sales. So, in other words, let's say it's 2035. Why would you buy an ice vehicle in 2030 when, you know, you know they, they, they're going to discontinue them in the future and the running cost of a five-year-old car in 2035 as a second-hand car will be hugely inferior, I would assume, by then to, a, to an EV. It's a great point. And I think this becomes harder to um, pick apart from an analytical standpoint because it comes more down to consumer choice. And I'm sure there will still be people out there um, who are very much in favour of internal combustion engine vehicles for you know whatever reason. I think you're right that when you start to look at kind of the impact down the line, if you want to, as you say, kind of resell that vehicle, or even if the number of um, kind of mechanics out there that can actually fix something if it goes wrong is reduced. It pushes you away from that kind of vehicle segment and pushes you towards EVs. In the UK, we're already seeing um, kind of government programs that are set up to retrain mechanics to deal with electric vehicles. Um, you know, we're talking kind of 15 years time before um, we get to the point where we have uh, an ICE phase out. But by that point, most mechanics will be proficient with uh, electric vehicles 
Um, and, you know, if I was a new mechanic getting into the business 18, 19 years old um, in 2030, 2032, you're not going to learn about an internal combustion engine vehicle because it's EVs that are going to be on the road. So I think it's a great point you've raised. Well, I, just anecdotally, uh, uh, James, and it really is, but literally I have not seen an advert for an internal combustion engine car since I've been in the UK. I've been in hard lockdown for 11 whatever how many days i've been here and literally i only see electric vehicle adverts and that's a great point as well you know i think um that's something that i've started to notice that you just don't see um companies advertising internal combustion engine vehicles going forward uh, at the moment and i can't see that happening going forward because of the public perception around the environment and sustainability um and we know that there's a reason that automakers spend so much on their advertising it's because it works um, so if they continue to pump money into their um, EV advertising, you know, again, I imagine that consumers will be more tuned to buying um, an EV. Definitely, that's that, that's what I've noticed. And now, just going slightly back to the to the economics, and this is the the question around uh, battery pack. You guys have always had, you know, the the annual, you know, the reduction of where we've come from and where we're going to. Um, my belief is uh, rightly or wrongly is if you can get the battery pack price down to 60 to 75 dollars per kilowatt hour you can electrify everything it makes it makes sense so lfp is not far from from that i mean i think if you were to do it in scale whereas i keep seeing and and market players are saying they're going to on a on a cost and performance basis, the high nickels are going to compete and, you know, it'll be very competitive going down the line. Do you still see that as the case, given where raw material prices are at for the high nickel side of things? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a, a, a great question. Um, and I think it's one that probably, again, needs that, um, you need the perspective of time. You know, certainly at the moment, <clears throat> those kind of key materials going into high nickel chemistries or nickel based chemistries um, are increasing and that is going to put pressure um, on um, manufacturers, automakers and cell manufacturers. Um, but in general, you know, we expect that the kind of price spikes that we'll see to be um, short term. So we might see a year or, 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 you know, slightly longer where we have high prices, but then we'd expect the prices to kind of return to um, you know, the average price that will help support the industry in expansion, but, um, you know, and give them a, a reasonable margin. Um, but we wouldn't expect prices to kind of, you know, stay at all time highs for, you know, two or three years in a row. So although we might see some kind of short term squeezes um, over the long term, by the time we get to kind of 2030, etc., we expect that there will be kind of new supply that will have been um, brought online and, and stimulate, stimulated by those periods of high prices. Um, and that that will kind of help to um, reduce some of the kind of cost constraints on these high nickel chemistries. But I think we also need to look beyond just the commodity prices themselves. Um, if we look at the cost of the cathode active material today, around 50% of that cost is the raw materials, but you're then looking at another 50% on top of that, that is the processing fee uh, and the margin that the kind of producer is, is adding on top of that. Um, so we're starting to see cell manufacturers already reducing that somewhat. So we're seeing more in-house production of cathode materials. So that's reducing some of that margin. Um, and I expect that over the next couple of years, we'll start to see more um, kind of uh, or, or changes to the processing um, technique and, and technology that will help to reduce the cost of going from um, your kind of nickel um, salts, cobalt salts, lithium salts, to your cathode active material. And so I think that will help to um, reduce the difference in um, kind of material price or, or between cathode material price between LFP and those high nickel chemistries. Um, okay. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, on top of that manufacturing processes as well, will have to improve. In a nutshell, the thesis of, of high nickel competing on a cost and performance basis is still sound being competitive. You know, I don't think high nickel will ever get down to the price of lithium ion phosphate. Lithium ion phosphate will probably always be that bit lower. 
but that would be countered by the you know the higher performance of the nickel based chemistry. Yeah, that's so what I, I mean. Think... The, the trade offs, but it's it's still good. One thing I've noticed is that uh, carbon footprint of everything is is coming up now, um, and we've seen offtake deals signed in the, the lithium world. Um, and I'm sure other things are going to come up. You know, our, our, our client uh, Talon with nickel, they're looking for, you know, a, a low or zero carbon, you know, nickel product and so on. You know, how important will that be on the battery cell manufacturing side? Because I've flagged this up. So LFP has a use case and a cost case, but the CO2 footprint of an LFP cathode and cell manufactured in China is not the same as Northvolt and Freya and these other battery cell plants that are going to come up in Europe that are looking to be zero, zero carbon. Now, carbon's rising, the tax is rising. I have a feeling looking at the way this is shaking out that carbon's going to be a hot market in the years to come. Um, you know, you know is, there, is there a risk at some point that Europe just says no to LFP coming out of China? You've got to make it in Europe, and then you've, it's a different price, different processes, different protocols, different criteria to meet to set up an LFP factory X china um, You know, does that level the playing field? And, and do you see people like, you know, Freyer and, and, um, and Northvolt and so on as being strategic because they... They've got the, the natural you know, sort of advantage in where they're located and, and what they're going to produce. So I know Freya well um, and, and know 24M's technology well as well. Um, and yeah, I, I've got to say, kind of from a technology standpoint, I'm a huge fan. It's an elegant technology. The processing it should be much simpler. That makes it more environmentally friendly and it reduces the cost. Um, as the kind of comparisons between, you know, Freya and, and, and other companies, um, I think it's interesting because it's probably the first time we've seen commercial production or, or the you know, scaling up of a completely new manufacturing process. And most of the you know, emerging um, cell manufacturers that we have in Europe, whether it's North Vault, British Vault, um, ACC, Vercore, you know, they're really just looking at kind of um, getting the technology that's on the ground today out there and, and building at mass, you know, large scale. Um, whereas if Freya can kind of implement it and they can kind of have a step change in the um, costs and performance, I think that gives them an advantage. The, the carbon emissions associated with battery manufacturing, you know, that's a key focus of the European um, battery directive is making sure that the batteries that are going into electric vehicles are sustainable. By 2024, manufacturers will have to um, provide information on the carbon footprint of those those cells. By 2027, there'll be standards brought in that they'll have to meet, and then they'll be ranked on a kind of A, B, C, D basis, which for, for those not in Europe, um, that's how electrical appliances are, are ranked today on how kind of energy efficient they are. So we'll see a similar ranking system for batteries. And, you know, part of that is to help um, consumers um, when it comes to deciding what EV to get. The emissions associated with producing LFP in China are high today. In the stationary storage market, currently our expectation is that by 2030, around 50 to 60 percent of the market will be LFP. One of the reasons for that is because China will account for around a third of the market, say. So, and, and all of China really today in stationary storage uses LFP, but we're seeing um, LFP demand grow outside of China. So we expect around 50% of storage deployments outside of China will be LFP and the rest will be kind of other nickel-based chemistries, but probably not as high nickel as we're seeing in the, the um, passenger EV sector. So the comments Elon Musk made around, you know, two-thirds iron, one-third nickel, um, we're seeing something similar, not quite that extreme, because we expect the stationary storage market to be smaller. Uh, at Tesla's battery day, Musk expects the, the stationary storage market to be kind of similar in size to the passenger EV market, if I remember correctly. Um, so if he's saying, you know, two thirds um, of demand iron and one third nickel, if all of that stationary storage market is lithium iron phosphate, um, you know, that means that uh, what around half of the, or a little under half of the um, passenger EV market 
will be iron phosphate and the rest will be kind of nickel nickel rich so not that dissimilar from what we're saying perhaps slightly more bullish on the lfp side of things um but not significantly so james so uh the catl had a, a sort of a launch or an announcement on sodium iron um put up a nice uh, spider web there like uh, albemol does essentially everything other than energy density against LFP looked promising. Um, I think 160 watt hours a kilo was their number versus 170, they're targeting 200. Got some feathers ruffled in terms of that announcement, but um, to be honest, I don't see it as a threat to lithium iron. I think the demand is so big. If you look at battery mega factory targets by 2030, it's just enormous demand everywhere. I actually see it as, as something positive because it can take care of possibly the low end of the market on energy storage if they can make it work. Um, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I, I'd actually agree with you here. I think um, the entrance of sodium iron into the market is a good thing because, as you say, it can help relieve some of those supply constraints with key materials. You know, if we're in a year where lithium prices are very high, um, and you're building say, a stationary storage project and you're looking for a lower cost solution, you have sodium iron there where energy density um, isn't too much of an issue. And I think that actually touches on a wider point that I, I didn't mention earlier, but you know, I think in the EV industry now, we have you know, so many kind of um, options for chemistry, for cell design, for et cetera, you know, those suppliers that actually it just helps build resilience. That if there's a shortage of a particular material or if there's kind of um, you know, supply constraints, it makes it that little bit easier to kind of switch to make things a bit more commoditized. And obviously, if you're an automaker, you can't just go from one manufacturer to another. But if you're a you know stationary storage developer, or in those kind of should we say swing applications, um, you know it gives you that resiliency. Um, but yeah, generally with sodium iron, I think it is a good thing for the industry. It can help to relieve some supply constraint for lithium. Uh, I think it makes sense for stationary storage. The thing, and I, I've got to admit, I was on holiday when the announcement came out and I'm still catching up on stuff, so I haven't watched the entire video. Um, but I think, you know, there was this talk of having um, AB um, type battery packs where you have lithium ion phosphate and, and sodium ion to kind of balance performance and, and, and cost. Um, and I think that's really interesting, um, but we've seen kind of automakers talking about this in the past, right? We've seen this discussion around mixing LFP cells with nickel based cells. And it's difficult because the BMS has to adapt to different voltage regimes and you have to kind of make sure that everything balances. So it, it's, it's certainly not a, in my books, you know, it's, it's not a certainty. Um, that being said, I think if any company was going to succeed at it, it's probably somebody like CATL, just because they have, uh, you know, so many people researching this stuff um, and they have the kind of networks to get automakers to adopt it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm more bullish on its use in, in um, the stationary storage market, certainly. I, I, and that's, I'd agree with you. I'd say it would be a success if it could, um, if it could, you know, alleviate and, you know, I guess let LFP redeploy into the EV sort of market more and, and I guess have some of it. I, the cycle life and everything looks like it is suitable for ESS. So we, we, we shall see. 